Okay, um, good afternoon, everybody. And um, I think we're, we are, ooh, we're just about ready to kick off the second half of today's uh, sets of, of presentations. And well, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce me. <laughs> Um, Lee Brennan, she will speak, as you, you can see shortly, on, on rejection. Um, uh, and I'll just, we, we, in situations like this, often the, the speaker will sp spend hours and hours or maybe a, a short period of time introducing the, the, uh, the speaker. And it is appropriate that I, I spend a little bit of time, but I'll try not to overdo it. Um, but yeah, Neve, um, Neve, graduated with a, a, a first class, and she was top in class uh, with a science degree, which is unusual uh, for somebody to be a professor in accounting, but in microbiology, biochemistry, I know nothing about it. I was dreadful at biology in comparison. I was bottom in the class at bi in biology, but Neef, top in the class, qualified as a chartered accountant with a firm similar to, as we heard earlier, that then became KPMG, or, um, and um, PhD from Warwick University, uh, Chartered Director of Institute of Directors in London, amongst, well, more than 100 publications. I'm envious of your H score. Um, it's an excellent H score, published widely in all sorts of areas. Um, corporate governance broadly, um, and was the first elected academic or business school academic to the Royal Irish Academy in, in Ireland, which is a, you know, an enormous achievement. Amongst others, I could go on and on and on, I'm not going to do that. What I will do is just say this, in, a, in, a, in the universities, it's quite common for academics to move from one institution to another, to another, to another, to another, uh, or at least move two or three times. It's not unusual. By contrast, it takes enormous fortitude and strength to be loyal to one university. And because ultimately universities have peaks and troughs and it can be very, very tough. Neither served UCD, I won't, embarrassed with the number of years. I thought I did well doing 22 at my previous university. You way outbid me on that one. So that takes enormous, it's an enormous achievement. It's rare that somebody can, can have the mental fortitude to, to do that. Um, but it's, it doesn't surprise me because of the nature of me. Anyway, that's enough from me. Um, I'll leave the rest to you. Thank you. Right. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and um, thank you very much for attending um, this session. I'd like to thank BAFA for inviting me to uh, deliver this keynote address. Specifically, Joan Ballantyne asked me last year would I do it, and Kevin, more than you could possibly realise, um, that introduction was absolutely superb, particularly your reference to my loyalty to my university. I absolutely, with a passion, love my university. Uh, and that reference to loyalty, you'll see, uh, is relevant to what I'm going to talk about today. And what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to tell you a very personal story. A personal story of rejection that defined my career. And I can only say that with the benefit of hindsight. At the time it happened, it did not feel like that at all. Until relatively recently, I kept my story a secret of my story, thinking that it was all my fault. 
This is only the second time I have publicly told this story, shared this story. And I hope in sharing it with you that it will provide you with some positive takeaways that may help you in your career. As well as telling you my personal story of rejection, I'm also engaging in some advertisement. So I'm going to illustrate my story of rejection um, with, as you can see in the title, some uh, insights from my 100 rules of the game. And my 100 rules of the game are two papers. One is 100 rules for a PhD, and the other is 100 rules for research. And those two papers were published in 2019 in AAAJ. And the two papers were handled by the poetry editor in AAAJ. That's AAAJ for you. It has a poetry section at the back end of the journal, and that's where the two papers are. And um, you can follow me on Twitter because every morning I tweet a rule of the game and my Twitter handle is at 100 rules of the game. Um, so I'm going to start with 100 rules of the game. Um, and um, it's hard to do something unless you enjoy it. And um, game is, I don't know how that happened. The first rule of the game is that you enjoy your research. And by the way, when I say enjoy, I mean that in a very pain, pleasure sense. Um, <laughs> it's not, it's a bit painful when Professor Bar Parker rejects your paper. So again, you have to really enjoy it to kind of deal with those kind of experiences. And if at this stage, as doctoral students, you're beginning to wonder whether this really is for you, I kind of think that may be um, a signal. Maybe, uh, you know, if you don't enjoy it, take that signal and take the learning from your doctoral studies and maybe do something else with it. Now, as Kevin said, um, I completed a science degree, microbiology and biochemistry in UCD, University College Dublin. I saw the light and I then immediately joined what is now KPMG and uh, trained and qualified as a chartered accountant. And I spent four years with KPMG and I'm going to just take a little sidebar to say to you, that recently two male professors asked me to participate in their um, research and their research was on female professors. So um, um, they asked me um, about my experience in KPMG and I said it was fantastic, it was great. And they questioned this because a lot of their female interviewees had had a very bad experience in the big four. And um, they wondered why I had had a good experience when most of their interviewees who are now academics had had a bad experience. And I said, I reckon it was because I left the firm one year after qualifying. I only spent four years in the firm. I was no threat to anybody as a one year qualified chartered accountant. And I think that's probably why I didn't experience some darker sides that maybe others of my female colleagues would have experienced. So as I said, I left KPMG and I joined back to my alma mater, University College Dublin, as an assistant lecturer. And in those days, you could become an assistant lecturer solely with the qualification of a uh, professional qualification of chartered accountancy. But it was made crystally clear to me um, that I had to do a PhD. Now, here was the experience of myself and my absolute friend and colleague, the other female in the department, Aileen Pierce. And regularly, I mean regularly, the professor of accounting 
used to say to our faces about the two of us that it was pin money for the girls. That's what he said to us. Our jobs as assistant lecturers were pin money for the girls. But strangely, we were both chartered accountants as he was himself. And so strangely, and maybe contradict a bit contradictorily, there was a certain professional respect. Uh, one chartered accountant to other chartered accountants. So there the was underneath the pin money for the girls, quip, there was a certain um, professional respect. So let me tell you what happened to me after um, I joined University College Dublin. And there she is, shamed, shamed by her university. Every year I received a letter from the bursar, a very nice man, Joe McHale, um, saying that I wasn't eligible for promotion because I hadn't got a PhD. Hold on a moment. I'm promotion. <laughs> <laughs> so I got these unsolicited letters and to say that I felt bad about not having a PhD, well, these letters, one every, every year they came, and it really rubbed it in. And um, I remained nine years as an assistant lecturer in UCD. I broke the record. They never had anybody at that low level for that long. <laughs> um, and a man who became the president, the CEO of my university, noticed. Patrick Masterson noticed, um, and he said, hold on, there, there's something wrong about this. And he uh, ensured that I did get promoted to the next level, which is fairly lowly as well, but at least it wasn't an assistant lecturer. He said I had to do a PhD. And he washed his hands of me. I really mean that. And Alien Pierce, we had absolutely zero support, no mentoring, no nothing. And strangely, in stark contrast to our male colleagues who were being sent to America, who were being supported, who were being nurtured, who were being funded. But as far as myself and Alien were concerned, washed their hands of it. And I look back on that and I think to myself, Actually, he probably didn't think we were able for it. He probably didn't think we were up to completing a PhD. I, I, that's my only effort as to try and explain why we got so zero, zero support, zero mentoring. And during all of those years, I finally worked it out for myself. No thanks to anybody but myself. And I'm sorry, and thanks to Aileen Pierce, um, because we were, we were research active, we were working on various uh, projects, and that actually helped me to work it out. Um, and I completed my PhD at the University of Warwick as an external student under the absolutely stellar supervision of Professor Sidney Gray, uh, J. Gray, and I was exceptionally lucky uh, that he took me on as a student. Um, but I had been publishing, and I, so I had four substantive books under my belt at this point, and now I had the PhD, right? So things were beginning to get on the rails for me. And, you know, with the four books and the PhD, for those days, my CV was beginning to look pretty strong. So having the publications and the PhD, I, I, I went for promotion. I actually went for promotion. And when I looked at the competition, I kind of thought, jeepers, I couldn't not be promoted. When I compared, <laughs> when I compared my, my CV with, with the competition, I just kind of, I couldn't not be promoted. I had the publications, I had the PhD. 
And the next thing that happened is that actually, um, there's my, sorry, four male colleagues were promoted and I wasn't. <laughs> did not see it coming I, I just it just was such a complete shock here I was thinking I was doing a good job I was enjoying my work and all the rest and the next thing is this came out of the blue I, I just did not see it coming at all um, and to be quite honest I still have not recovered from that <laughs> psychological body blow. It still is deeply, deeply affects me. Um, but anyway, I decided that um, though I had no option, but I had to take my medicine. And I said, so I put the head down, uh, took my medicine, kept my mouth shut, didn't complain, and felt that the next round of promotions I'd get promoted and I'd move on. Because the danger in that situation is that you damage yourself if you, if you react inappropriately. So the next um, promotion opportunity occurred. Um, and here's what happened. were promoted ahead of me and I wasn't. Um, and this was thanks to three deans and a member of staff who's currently still a member of staff uh, at my university. And the four of them colluded to ensure that I did not get promoted. Um, and I realized that taking my medicine was not a good strategy. This sent a signal to the three deans and their honchos. It sent a signal but actually, this was a piece of cake. And should they do it again? Should they get away with it the first time? Should they do it again? So, to lawyer up. And I can tell you, I lawyered up very aggressively. And I gave my lawyer, in no uncertain terms, very aggressive instructions as to how to deal with my case with the university. Oh. <laughs> um, my lawyer was also the member of parliament in the constituency that my university is located. And this had a side to my lawyer who received the aggressive instructions, also my husband. <laughs> the uh, then CEO of my university at 7.30 in the morning. And this, the president, as we call uh, the person, the president got out of the shower at 7.30 in the morning, thinking that the local member of parliament had something important to, to talk to him about the university. But actually, uh, it was to convey the uh, message from his uh, client, also his wife, <laughs> um, that I was not going to take this line down because I'd done it once and it, whatever. <laughs> so in fact, what the president at that time did was he made no promotions on the grounds of inappropriate procedure. I don't have to go into all the details about that. And then I finally got promoted in the next round. Um, and then the next thing that happened was, on very unexpectedly, in fact, nobody expected it except maybe me and one or two of my female colleagues. And actually, the fact they didn't expect it was helpful because had they had any that the next thing that, that happened would happen, they would have taken steps to stop it. But they didn't see the danger. And the danger was, I got that chair. And it was a hugely completed chair. There was a huge application because it was a generic chair open to everybody in any discipline within what was then the Faculty of Commerce. 
And I was very lucky they did, they had so convinced themselves how bad I was that they never took steps to stop me getting that chair and I got it. And that I can tell you got the monkeys off my back and I've never looked back. So once I got my chair, I was, I was on a roll. Now, this is my personal story. And I now want to share with you some insights, again, with the benefit of hindsight, and um, to maybe help you in your career if you come up against rejection. And I'm you're guaranteed you're gonna come up against rejection. That's our world, the academic world. So um, I'm going to give you a picture of Neve. So brace yourself <laughs> for a picture of Neve. <laughs> I have the hide of a rhinoceros. And here's another picture of Neve. I'm like a dog with a bone. I will not let it go. And these are characteristics that actually Lee mentioned this morning. Um, um, and back to the roots of the game, it, capturing what Lee was telling us this morning. Um, you have got to be absolutely determined, dogged, and persistent. And these great credentials are far more um, important, and Lee said this himself, than IQ. Those are the characteristics that, uh, you know, help me uh, with those uh, great credentials. So, um, Here's what happened when I was in purgatory, thanks to my three deans and colleagues. I had two Eureka insights, and these are the insights that I hope you will find valuable. The first insight was, I prove them wrong. So instead of kind of getting angry, I was very angry. So, but I channeled my, angry, my anger into productivity. I didn't, uh, you know, so it was angry productive, if I could put it like that. I was proving them wrong. And the second insight was they cannot take my track record away from me. They can stop me being promoted, but they cannot take my track record away from me. And the shock of what happened, it's still, I am feel it to this day. And so strangely, to this very day, those two insights drive me. Um, I proved them wrong, and they cannot take my track record away from me. And I just keep doing it, and I've passed them out. Uh, there were 10 rate academics with Mickey Mouse records themselves. So, you know, um, <laughs> anyway, as you can see, it's still in my viscera, right? <laughs> Now, um, I'm still trying to prove them wrong, and I'm very focused on my track record. Rejection is energy. That has given me such energy that it's um, contributed to my track record. And I put up um, as a symbol of my track record, my Google Scholar profile, but hold on a moment. That is not important. This stage, far more important than my track record is, am I a good colleague? Um, do I help my students? Member of my academic community. These are far more important than my track record. So, you know, unless it's the journey, happens in the crazy world of academia nowadays. <laughs> but if it, if it, I do it. That is about academic community. So those human values are far more important than my academic track record, although I'm a proud of enough, a proud of it, proud enough of it, um, uh, not as good as Professor Parkas, but look, you can't have it. <laughs> So another rule of the game, um, I have in my head um, publication targets, and I find it personally motivational that I have certain key performance indicators for myself, which motivate me 
you know, to keep going. Um, but I'll caution this. And the first person I heard say this was actually Professor Lee Parker. And here is my caution that I heard him uh, many years ago make the similar observation. Remember this, the Dean's key performance indicators are not your key performance indicators. Had I followed the then Dean's key performance indicators, I would have ruined my career. And remember also that the Dean's key performance indicators keep on shifting. Professor Parker's advice is that you need to work it out for yourself and you need to work out your game plan. But don't let the Dean kick his fingers, note the gender bias, um, and uh, you know, make, make your game, make his game plan your game plan, okay? Um, now, funnily enough, it continues to this day, I'm sorry to tell you, I have a colleague, let's call him, sir, put me down. Very soft. I'm going to be seeing Neve tomorrow. This is what I'm going to say to her. Um, and it's like being stung by a wasp. And the wasp has flown away, and then suddenly you feel the sting. And by the way, the worst of Professor Put Me Down's behavior is at my father's funeral. He put me down at my father, and it was as if I was kicked in the stuff. So I have to put up with that stuff to this day. But bizarrely and strangely, the more Professor put me down, puts me down, the more I think, hold on a moment, something right <laughs> to be getting under that guy's skin who, uh, you know, doesn't have a very good uh, academic track record. And, now, just to finish off with, again, some kind of more personal insights. Um, friendship. What carried five dark years was my friends in uh, UCD. And as I've said to you, one of my best friends was Aileen Pierce. Um, and um, she sent me an email recently about this story. And I'll read out what she said in the email. I think it's really rather nice. You and I were lucky to have each other in those days in UCD. I don't think we fully appreciated some of the ingrained prejudices in our environment at that time. But, she said, we benefited at the same time from so many nice characteristics of the academic life in those early years. The friendships, the networks, the respect for accountants even, she said. And I'm gonna um, finish off um, because you need teams, you know, you, you need to have a team, you need to have a team around you. So I'm going to show you my best team. They always stood by me and given the difficulties subsequently with my career, um, I didn't put career ahead of family. In fact, I had my third son, here's my best team, I had my third son uh, in the middle of my PhD because my biological clock was running out far faster than my PhD clock. But given, given what happened, imagine if I had been stupid enough to decide I wasn't gonna have my third son uh, because I needed to finish my PhD. So I'm gonna finish with how I started and I'm finishing with the same rule of the game and that is enjoy your research. So thanks for listening to me. Well, thank you very much. Brilliant presentation. And can you answer to any other questions from the audience? I'm sure there'll be at least one or two. Okay, right at the back. 
Hello. Can you hear me? Sorry, got you ask a question, I'll sort this out. What happened to all of that? Can, can you say that you love your institution? Are you able to separate the institution and the practices that go on within it with the people? I mean, how are you able to do that? I, I, I don't associate my institution with every individual that works in my institution. So, you know, um, I think an awful lot of good goes on in my institution. Um, and I think probably there are some bad things. And sadly, uh, to this day, there are bad things happening. So I kind of make a distinction, if I could put it like that. And, you know, as Kevin said, I've been at the same institution for a long time. Maybe I've become institutionalized. But I, I, I do feel extraordinarily positive towards my institution. It motivates me because I want a job because I want my institution to do well. Um, but it doesn't mean to say that I believe everything that goes on in my institution is good. And that's the reality of life. Life is uh, So none of us, by the way, you don't work in an institution that's all 100% positive. Um, but I, 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 I suppose I get, I get, I do, I'm not. I don't like people who are constantly giving out about their institutions. You know, I think that, uh, you know, there's good and bad. It's not all bad. Kevin, can you hear me? Yeah, there's a question online. Yeah. Um, yeah. Fadi, Fadi, Fadi Al Karan. Can you hear me, Kevin? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. I would like to thank you so much, Professor Neve. We are learning every time, every conference, every meeting. We are learning a lot from you. And honestly, this is provide us with a lot of, you know. To like you know resilience in terms of our career, in terms of our network, in terms of the way we will develop ourselves. I highly appreciate your attendance, and we already acknowledge your contribution for Bafa conference. And I do I I would like to highlight you know what you have probably you know it's about UCD community and and please if you don't mind just mention about Professor Amon Walsh who we miss him and his sadness leave and this is not only loss for ucd community it's loss for bafa for the whole academic professor amon watch if you'd like please need just to mention about his contribution as well thank you and thanks Hadi, for that and we're all very much missing amon um who was a larger than life character until he died very untimely Have, uh, the kind of support that you have nowadays, they weren't always there. Now, um, you're lucky in that respect. On the other hand, the demands of the academic life are massively higher than they would have been in my day. So it, it swings and roundabouts. But on the other hand, you're expected to publish in, in four-star journals Five a year minimum. <laughs> so, so you know, it is a bit of a roller coaster. Uh, you get a better training now than in my day, but your, the expectations and demands on you 
are becoming, I have to say, completely unrealistic, and in my opinion, Okay, yeah. Thank you very much for your inspiring uh, story. Uh, I would like to know the experience that you had uh, in UCD as contributing to your loyalty. Because you wanted to stay back in a way to contribute to some changes because of your personal experience. And to follow on that, how, what, what advice would you give to someone who probably might want to leave his or institution because of some of these personal challenges that they may have faced. And um, well, in the small little goldfish bowl that I come from, Ireland, there are, you know, how many, is there uh, five universities in the Republic of Ireland? So there were only five alternatives. I had a family, I was in Dublin. So there's only there's three universities in Dublin. So, you know, part of the loyalty, as you call it, Kevin used that word, is it, it was pragmatic. Because, um, you know, well, I wasn't going to go to the competition down the road, Trinity College or Dublin City University. So in a way, the context forced me, it would say, to be loyal. And again, when I look back on it, I couldn't off and I hope it gone elsewhere, but I stuck it out. And actually, when I look back on it, I was so much better off All the time so you know and i think my resilience uh, got me to stick it out uh, but it was it was a very unhappy five years i have to say you know so um and it's probably thank you for listening to my story because in a way it's a part of actually tell my story and to get it out of my system <laughs> thank you thanks so much for sharing <laughs> Inspiring, and um, I have lots of my own stories that I can tell. Very happy to share my own stories. Um, but I was wondering, I, I really like this um, the fact that you lawyered up. And I was wondering at what point do you think that one has to actually take institutional, you know, find an institutional environment? And if you have any suggestions for what kind of strategy might be effective at enacting change? Um, well, some of my more junior colleagues are being appalling at that issue at the moment, and I have advised them to lawyer up and from the get so, uh, you know, and let all guns blaze. They are preparing. You need to put it in yourself. So, um, you know, um, back on my own experience, and you can never say how it would have worked out. You'd come out the first time all guns blazing. Um, I don't know what would have happened, but I would certainly be thinking, given my experience, that I'd be saying to people, look, watch your back. Watch your back. These are in powerful positions. Watch your back. And that may involve getting some legal advice sooner rather than later. later. You don't have to use the legal advice, but you need to be prepared in case it turns nasty. And I have seen it turn very nasty with other people, not just me. So um, I would, I would, and then obviously in terms of the strategy, again, um, you know, it depends on the circumstances. I would say I'm married to a lawyer. One of the three, I would say that lawyers tend to be trigger happy, and I think you know, uh, if you lawyer up, well, don't. And not damaging yourself. That is a very fine line. And I feel I was very lucky that I wrote that fine line. And that may have been because I was married to a lawyer. Um, and I could just say that his ears angst that he had to listen to me during, uh, during that five years. But I mean, he was he was a fantastic emotional outlet for the stress I was experiencing. And you know, he, he was giving me, I would say, good advice. I was very, very so it's it's a fine line between very much to do with your career. It's a very fine line, I think it's one that you need to manage very carefully. I think I'd just further to make sure you've got evidence to support 
whatever case you're going down that path because you know you, you really can ruin your career if you're going weak well you know we have in ireland a thing called the workplace relations council or something like that and you may end up getting you know fifty thousand from uh, the workplace relations council but i mean is it worth it if you like you know right. again it's a long career going to influence the rest of your career, what you're doing now. So it is a very long game. And I think that you could get a few, a few, uh, hundred, a few tens of thousands compensation or something, but is it really worth it? So then you're all the time trading off the costs and the benefits. Hi, thank you. Uh, I guess well, I, I'm sure that a few people in the room can relate to your experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I can completely, because in my case, it lasted 15 years, not right. five. Right. Uh, and of course, I was the wrong color. And like you, I was super smart from day one. And that became the biggest problem, right? So I've actually, I've just finished an autoethnography uh, for Hendrik Wolmer's book. And same thing, the cathartic experience that you have and I had as well. But I'm encouraging others also to do that because it's it's a real struggle. But the point I would like to make, and it's uh, related to you, but also it's an extension. This last week in the news, there was a massive crisis in the CBI, and it was to do with women and exploitation. CBI is an industrial body; they were exploiting women, and then and then it turns out it was cultural crisis. Nowhere in the media did I see a mention that part of the problem is this is a monoculturally led organization. And there are many in UK, Ireland, everywhere where the top is white, right? Now, this is where this kind of problem really festers. So in a way, institutions, they will not say, it, but they need diversity uh, of color because what happens with color on the top table is people that the inner club cannot predict easily how the black person is going to vote. And they can't stand that. Actually, that's also why they don't want the black person in the top table. But uh, it is harrowing. So, and then there's this whole thing about intersectionality. I don't know if people have heard that word, maybe it'll come later, is when minorities have not just one difference, but a several. So gender is one, black could be another, third could be disability. So when you add different uh, criteria to your minority status, things become that much worse often in institutions. Now, in my case, uh, you know, I was interviewed, I was a lecturer at a university and I was being interviewed for chairs at top universities at that time, but my university refused to promote me. In the end, I gave up academia. I've been out of it. I was out of academia for 15 years. So the, the other side of the story and come relating to yours as well, is when they kill you, they kill your enthusiasm as well, which is priceless. The enthusiasm with which you come to the profession is worth more than anything, and that gets destroyed. That's why I raised this point earlier in the PhD, Dr. Malonke. Majority of students are ethnic minorities. We are funding a lot of the PhD programs in these universities, right? And, and we are, you know, the treatment is still very poor. We are, you know, just because we have a different accent, we are stupid. Just because we come from a foreign country, we are we are stupid. It's so subconscious. It's not conscious, it's subconscious. But things need to change. But also people need to realize they need us really to make these institutions sustainable <coughs> on that top table. When I got, I'll tell you, when I first got my chair after 40 years or whatever, my salary was 50,000 pounds. Now, if you look at the British Accounting and Finance Association survey of professors, the average salary for an accounting professor is 120,000 pounds. My institution didn't even want to listen. Right? So this is the reality of what happens to color and when color reaches power and when that color has got a multiple skills, intellectual, communication, leadership, oh my God, that completely throws them. But this is what happens. The institutions will rot if they don't have people like us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Atul. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think, Atul, I don't know uh, 
anyone in the room here has an interest, but well, I have an interest in equality, and I've been leading on the Athena Swan application. We just got our bronze award for the Ulster University Business School. Um, and I know people can, if they're interested, and in, it's not only gender, but the new Athena Swan charter is right under sexuality. So if people have an interest in, you know, going into this area and making progression, you know, there was lots of things I was able to identify because I'm quite, you know, if, it's, if I see it, I'll just say it's there. And I'm not, I don't care what the dean says or the senior leadership team, I'll say it's there and we've got to do something about it. So there is an opportunity for faculty to get involved in initiatives like Athena Swan uh, and to try and make a difference in terms of uh, inclusivity and equality. So, you know, have a look, even for PhD students, they're always looking for PhD, you know, for students to join the, the self-assessment team. So if anybody has an interest, I just thought it was useful that you can actually do something about it and actually call things out as a result of you working on those sorts of things. Yeah, I think, I think I mean, not all universities are the same either. I think we have to be careful on this. And, well, um, yeah. and you know, I, I've moved from one university where the ethnicity was extraordinarily different to where I am now. Um, so they're not all the same. So, you know, that there are other ways we, we can try and fight within, but you can move. I didn't move for that reason, but, um, there, you know, not all universities are the same, not all accounting groups are the same. And do you feel your department is richer for the diversity? I enjoy it. If you, yeah, absolutely. But I'm, I'm not saying that my division, just my, my previous university was, you may say, more like me. You might say that. Um, even though I'm from the north and that nobody else is remotely near from my geographical <laughs> location. <laughs> Um, not a, not Sorry, I didn't understand. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Subtitles are available. Yes. Um, uh, but um, yeah, no, absolutely. I agree. Anyway, sorry. Any more questions? Oh, um, Chinere. Sorry. Hi, Chinere. Um, I think it's years ago that you said one of the secrets to survive is make sure you don't go to advocate teachers. Make yourself valuable. And I did think that of course. Well, there's so many issues in university, and I don't think there's any perfect university, just there's the up and downs. And I'm actually surprised me was talking about, oh, we understand the unit field of the So there's no perfect university. But you have to find ways to survive. And I come from the University of Bristol, it's my same wise. In the country of finance, we have over self to start, and we still have black one in finance and in the diversity. So just in case you want to join the university, it's a nice thing. Okay, so how much do you want to join? There's an outlet for Bristol. Lee, sorry. So, um, I wonder if, the, if you comment, I, I totally support what you say about the role of your local friends and colleagues and your family as support. I just want to, because I think people might learn from you, uh, what do you think about the broader networks, how you build those, you know, that support that's outside your university, you know, the people who know, how did I meet her? Because my co-editor, James Guthrie, said to me, oh, you're going to Glasgow, you should go to UCD. He said, why should I go to UCD? He said, oh, you should meet my really good colleague, Dean Brennan. <laughs> so I lined up to do a seminar, I turn up, I get the interview with the great person there, and we exchange the pleasantries, and then in her inimitable style, as you can see, she says to me, so why are you really here? I said, uh, well, because James says, you know, your great colleagues and I should come and see you. She said, I've only met him once on the back of a conference boat at Sydney Harbour. I said, I'll kill him. <laughs> now, our relationship from there, I went back to Australia and of course said to him, you know, what the hell were you saying? He said, but she's good, isn't she? And I said, she's really good. Now, we went from there. There's a very long story where we go from there. Apologies, don't mean to go on. But if you've got any comments to the PhD students about, you know, the 
the way in which even serendipitous you build networks of support and what those mean to you. Um, well, thanks, Lee, for, for those remarks. Um, and um, I, I'm not a sycophant. I tell it like it is. But getting in to the AAAJ community, it was a crossroads in my career. And that happened because I went to a conference in Amsterdam and uh, there was a, it was in Amsterdam, James, or, or Lee, and I was sitting, I didn't know anybody at the conference and I was sitting uh, on my own. And the next thing is this uh, in your face character, James Guthrie sits down beside me. And that was when I got into the AAAJ community. And the way in which Lee, you and James nurtured that community is exceptional. Um, it really is exceptional, but getting into it, it I, I feel it kind of changed my career. Um, and that's why I've said this to you many times before, AAAJ is, is absolutely uh, my favorite journal. I think it's very inclusive. It's very eclectic, uh, but it's, you feel, you actually feel part of a community. So, you know, I have benefited hugely from that AAAJ community. And then in turn, and this is what's clever about what um, Lee and James do, they benefit too. So when Lee sends you an email asking you to review a paper, there is in zero question of saying that because you're part of the community and the, being part of the community is, is, is a bit of give back. And I, I was involved in a journal for a very short space of time as an associate editor. I resigned very quickly. But an interesting thing about the journal is they paid academics to review papers. And it had the bizarre effect of paying academics excuse to say no. I won't take your money and I won't do the review. So I resigned from that journal, told the editor, I couldn't continue as an associate editor in the journal where the people in the community of the journal would not do the work. So um, that's why, again, and, and, and the other good thing about the community, around you who are supportive, nurturing, helpful and whatever. So. Um, that, that's where I think, um, you know, Lee and James have, have, have a perspective that's about human beings and not about rankings, not about, you know, number of citations. Number of They're all good at that. But at the end of the day, it is a human activity and treating human beings in your community properly is, is absolutely essential. So, um, you know, I'll always be grateful to Lee and James and their uh, two great characters. We're so lucky in our community to have people like that. So thank you, Lee. Never know who you're going to meet and you never know where that's going to go. So value every person you meet because it could be five years, seven years later, all of a sudden, somehow you come together. That, that's how a lot of these things start. Sorry, sorry Trevor, I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> it's like a skate ball, probably. Yeah, just a couple of things. One is that I agree with your uh, point about don't believe in deeds, particularly mm -hmm. research deeds. They will ask for stupid, unattainable targets. The question you have to ask is, yes, you have to produce, but if they get rid of me, will they get anybody better? And that's when you realise what is a reasonable productivity. The other thing I, I always tell my PhD students is find your tribe. Your tribe will look after you and it will defend you. Because there are other tribes out there that may be out to get you. Uh, and really, I've been very fortunate in my work. I could not have done what I've done had it not been for the groups, workshops, and things of which I was a member. And I think a big mistake a lot of PhD students and young academics are doing is thinking that the longer they spend in their office 
looking at the computer, the more they will produce. It doesn't work like that. It's the company you keep, it's the ideas that you debate over, it's the new insights you get from others. Don't stick in your office just pounding out words. to Trevor, maybe link the two points as well, in a way, and um, it might be knowing your strengths. So if you think about it, you, you said about research deans, and deans now often have, they're trying to push on papers, in, in, in my, when I was a PhD, it was just papers, but papers and grant income and impact case studies, and I remember a dean saying to me, you know, you haven't brought in seven-figure research income this year. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I don't need a laser. Um, but we don't need lasers to do our kind of, but there, there are genuinely think we should be pulling in vast amounts of money. Um, but knowing your strength, so if, you're, if your strength is going out and being in media and, 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 and um, pushing on that front, so you might publish papers, but also get out on, on, on camera and, and TV and whatever, that's fine. But trying to do everything that some deans seem to want us to do, so multiple amounts of income, many THD students, impact case studies, walking on the moon. <laughs> you, know, you, you can't do everything. So try and find your strengths. And, not, and, and I'd also say, within, even within your own research, are you a positivist or an interpretivist? Or you know, what, where do you fit best? Then you'll find your tribe. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. And if you haven't got one, find one exactly. yourself. Or they'll find you. No, create it for yourself. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. About run out of time, but can we thank me for some fun? Two things, announcements. We've got tea and coffee and sessions running afterwards. Um, but there is a reception right outside here after uh, the sessions end uh, today. And the second one, the dinner tonight is in the Cubanus, which is basically right by City Hall. So if you if you follow the tram line, you get on the tram like I did this morning, or you follow the tram line, it stops right at City Hall. Uh, it's near most of the hotel. Yeah. And, and just also, uh, for those of you who want the camping certificate, they're available at the percent registration at the board I, 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 I,